Ricky Hardy and Michael Ford are coming. Ellen Wilkinson, the red flag, she is humming. We get around not as much as Dominic Cummins, even though he's driving blind. We are the river grassroots, where like minded folk dwell. From countryside to city, it's warm and sweaty. The antidotes are pretty Patel. We are the labor grassroots. Time to raise a racket. The future is as bright as Crispin's red jacket. This is the space where we all go help a leather. Free from all the biased BBC blather. Like track and trace, we're better together. Just that's carrying me. Yeah, we got all the people from Inverness, Skegness, Farrell and Furness, Chester, Leicester, Simon, Sester, Trosby, Oswald Street, Swansea, Manackley, Barnsley, Beckles, Nottingham and Eccles. We are the labour grassroots. Time to plant some grass. Where yeah, we've always had social distancing between us and the upper class. <laughs> Welcome to Labour Grassroots, uh, where we have one hour show talking about how we're all coping with lockdown. And uh, we're, we've got people from all over the country. Uh, we've had a survey out um, in the last couple of days. And I'd like to start the, the show by actually um, showing what some of the results were from, from the survey that we put out. Um, the one that um, is most alarming to me. Is, the, is about mental health. Um, have you experienced um, mental health because of lockdown? Um, over 30% of people replied that they had um, experienced mental health issues. Um, and, and the other, I mean, not, not, not only that, but um, if we look at the other survey, uh, over, you know, nearly 60% of people uh, had uh, experience of other people um, having mental health issues during lockdown. Um, I think that this issue of uh, mental health is really not being talked about enough um, on the media and generally in politics. Um, so I've got some people for, who answered the survey um, who will be talking about that. Um, Carol, who's uh, a regular on the show, uh, is is on is on the call carol are you there yeah um so you you work with community support um in yeah. london what what's what's your experience of um, uh, how mental health has been affected by lockdown well firstly i just want to say a personal thing which is about the fact that i had to shield with um a relative at home and uh for 12 weeks and um that was very, very difficult for me as well, because as a parent of someone who had to shield, um, they were climbing up the wall because they couldn't go out and they couldn't do things and trying to get stuff that they were able to do in order to occupy them and not think about having to try and go out. They couldn't see their friends. They couldn't. Um, it became very, very stressful. So I had to try and keep calm and I'm generally level headed and so on. So, you know, even I was struggling because I also had an elderly relative who lives alone and um, was isolated. Um, and, and that again, miles away, uh, meant that we couldn't see each other, but they weren't on Zoom. They weren't even internet connected. They couldn't use anything and still that is the case and they still feel um very anxious a lot of the time very anxious going out now um well, but i work with i work with a lot of um people with mental health conditions whether it's depression anxiety um or more serious uh ones like um uh what was called schizophrenia i think most people here would probably call it uh, schizophrenia but uh, audio um, hallucinations and um, uh, and they were finding it exceptionally difficult because many of them couldn't actually communicate on telephones, became more paranoid, uh, became very depressed to the point at which they didn't know 
who to speak to, um, how to communicate with people. Um, and I think it's wrong to believe that those people who, you know, do get depressed and spend a lot of time, perhaps indoors on their own or isolated, found it easier. They didn't. They found it more difficult because they often couldn't get hold of the services. They may not have had a support worker. They may not have been able to get hold of someone they normally did or um, and benefits as well. Uh, the benefits system has changed during lockdown and um, online applications and appeals and telephone health assessments have all come in. And I've seen people absolutely struck dumb by or they don't know what to do. And I've had people crying, screaming, suicidal ideation thoughts uh, about not wanting to be here and fearful now of going out. And I believe some of them, though undiagnosed at the moment, have developed agoraphobia. Now for children, I think it's been dreadful. Um, the services have always been stretched. I don't think teachers or schools have had any kind of support really to cope with the amount of um, difficulties they're coming across with children coming back into school. But even during lockdown, um, I know teachers, I was involved in the teacher uh, NEU campaign, and um, I know teachers who um, were saying that everyone thinks the key workers children who were being at, at um, school during this time were okay. Well, many of them weren't actually. And some of the reasons they weren't was because they didn't know whether their parents who had gone off to work in frontline services were going to come home or whether they were gonna come home with COVID, whether they were going to die, you know, and um, I think there's there's lots of issues that are just not being discussed. Right. And the so resources Carol, I, are being I, shrunk. Yeah, Carol, sorry, I'm, I don't want to- The government's doing sod all really. I, yeah, well, I don't, I don't want to butt in on you, but I do have no. to because we've got so many people on the call. Yeah, no, uh, I think, I think- so thank you. There's sorts of issues we're dealing with. Thank you. We'll, we'll probably catch up with you later as we normally yeah. do. Uh, 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 Liz, Liz Hughes, are you are you there, Liz? Just unmuting. Hello, everybody. It's lovely to see everybody from all over the country. So, um, um, have you have you noticed uh, a rise in mental health issues uh, where you are? You're in, in Ipswich, aren't you? Yes, and. It's been a bit strange down here because we've got had a very low infection rate and a lot of people either work locally or they're travelling out of Ipswich, normally into central London or to Bury St Edmunds, Colchester to work. And that's stopped. And um, we've had a lot of issues with mental health with people in a limbo, not knowing what's going to happen next. So um, I'm a local councillor and the practical things we've been able to do are to listen to people on the phone and try and signpost them to what limited so, um, services there are but we had a sort of caesura of about eight weeks at the beginning where there was nothing there was nothing in place there was nothing definite that people could sort of grasp hold of and say well you know I should do this or I should be should go there or what have you so a lot of hands-on stuff was going on here we had a, a huge reaction from the community I mean really from the grassroots in our poorest areas for example we were, I'm involved in a group called Together We Will Grow which was encouraging people on one of the big council estates here to dig their gardens and grow crops literally grow potatoes grow, which sounds really basic we had about 500 people involved and a lot of very deprived households um secondly one of the one one of the really good things that's come out of lockdown has been the finally the government said all right we can find money to take every homeless person off the street and for us that was um, approximately 66 people who we were able to take off the street and put into b&bs that were empty because they had no, if you like, non-homeless customers. So that's been quite successful. Over 40 of those people are now in um, council accommodation. So we've been quite specific council or housing association. Yeah. So it's given them a break. And the people that I see around who were drug users, mental health issues, etc., have, I've got to say, have improved hand on heart because they were in one place and they had a lot of support volunteer workers a lot of those support workers are now getting laid off and that's going to be another thing that we're going to have to face. Um, and finally, the 
a lot of our surgery, so my local surgery, big surgery with 15,000 people on the book, books has done a lot previously a lot of home visits and outreach work with people with mental health issues that's just not happened and um, the group that's really been hit with children I want to just join in with what Carol said we have a real poverty of IT here we have poor people living in Ipswich they're on zero hour contracts they're on the lowest wages in East Anglia this is a very low wage economy Crispin and they're they can't afford £30 a month for an internet connection. Their kids don't have a laptop. And the shock that one of our local charities went up to central London when they were talking about children learning by um, via IT, there was a sort of presumption that everybody and every child has access to a computer or a laptop or a tablet and can do this. And that's we know that's just not the case. So that's really shown a real divide in IT poverty which we knew existed but now has proven it right. beyond doubt so coming out with mental health I'm, I'm still going to share this here um, my, a year ago my husband was diagnosed with cancer and he died in January after three months I went back in the office on March the 23rd and got sent home I've not been in the office since I've been on my own and um, the first five weeks were very frightening. I thought I was going to die in my bed of COVID. And that sounds trite now to say it. And I want to thank all the Labour family. Without the Labour family and without my colleagues in the Labour Party and my colleagues in the trade union, GMB trade union, who checked up on me every day, I don't know how I would feel now. So I want to put a big thank you out there because it has been without our Labour. That does sound trite but I don't care. Without the Labour family, I think a lot of us would be in a worse place. So there you go, Chris, right. and thank you. Everybody. I'm sorry to hear the news and, th- and thank you for coming on. It's good to see you. Um, I'm going to move on to um, Denise. Uh, who... Denise, are you there? Hello. Hi, Denise. Um, have you... Have you uh, experienced um, an increase in mental health conditions around you or have you got a, a, a story to tell about that since the lockdowns happened? Well I think it's affected everybody I don't think there's one aspect of society that hasn't been impacted in some way by the measures. Um, I run out of school art clubs at a school and also at a um, what was previously a sure start centre, which is now a children's centre. And I'd usually you run holiday workshops for targeted children, many of which live in very, very difficult circumstances. And um, I haven't had the opportunity to do anything with them since before Easter. Um, I know that many of those children had no internet access Uh, They were trapped in small flats with no gardens. And I know that they suffered um, very bad mental health issues, living in sometimes quite dysfunctional families. And of course, all it's done is that the inequality that existed existed before has been exacerbated with the measures. And um, I feel very blessed actually. I've got a house, I've got a garden, I had some company during lockdown, but many people did not have it, have any company. Um, I I feel as I have suffered mental health uh, myself because I'm a self employed person, and uh, the rug was just pulled out from beneath the feet of self employed people like myself. I'm an artist. Um, I provided work for eight other artists who like me have been left with a very precarious future. Um, We've managed to go back into one of the schools that we worked in previously, but we're all working half the number of hours. So that's half the amount of money coming in. So I feel very insecure actually, and um, I'm not alone. So one thing that has worried me a lot is um, children from uh, uh, areas of Brighton which uh, are deprived. 30% of Brighton lives in poverty and um, uh, going to school was actually a safe space for them to go to and they haven't had that. Um, I think as I said previously I work in a children's centre and they're not planning to open until January 
So this crucial place in the middle of the community isn't open um, uh, to provide a safe space for the children uh, and for parents to access any help they may need. And there was a good, good reason why Sure Start centres were open. They were there for early intervention to try and alleviate some of the problems that uh, families experienced. And that has gone. And I think that's left them very vulnerable. Um, well, that, th thank, you for, thank you for coming on and, and sharing it. It sounds to me um, like the, the stress of work as much as of, of people not having any um, where to go for children and stuff is, is really taking its toll. Um, with no uh, financial security. I mean, that's, it's, it's a terrible situation. I'm just going to bring in um, Chris, um, who's, who also responded to the survey. Are you there, Chris? Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, what, what do you think about what you've heard so far? Well, a lot of it's just the same situation here. I'm in Grimsby. We had the lowest number of cases, but now it's starting to rise quite rapidly. Um, I had to take seven weeks off work. I should have took 12, but by week six, I was climbing the walls. I live in quite a big flat, but it kept getting smaller and smaller. It's only the sheer fact that the park around the corner saved my sanity. But some of my friends, they've um, working in the big supermarkets. They've had to, they kind of had to change their shift patterns. They've become recluse. They've, their mental health has basically fallen through the floor. It's uh, it's just surprising. It was only the only the internet and the park that kept me sane. I sort of started getting into a rut of vaguely walking, getting out of bed, watching Night Rider on TV, go back to bed. That's how it basically. Um, I was worried about because I wasn't at work for seven weeks. Is what am I going to do? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to pay the bills? That sort of the lack of a support network really, well, really took its toll. I ended up saying, "Right, I have to go back to work." And ran my HR department and went back to work. So it's uh, quite a, you don't realise how small things get so on top of you. It was quite, quite shocking. How do you feel now, how do you feel now that, that, that the restrictions have eased a bit, but then they might be coming back? How, does that make you apprehensive, especially with the winter? It, it makes me slightly apprehensive. Uh, where I work has just got its, uh, well, first reported case. So I work one of the big um, companies in my in town. It's had its first reported case last week, and that sort of put me a bit on edge. Um, it's, do I go back? To, do I keep going back to work? I should isolate, but it's like, no. I think I'm better off amongst people, to be honest. Right. I get what I mean? It's. Uh... Thank, thank you for coming on um, the show and being so uh, open and honest with us. Thank you. No problem. Um, and uh, Rachel in Southport. Um, are you there, Rachel? I am, yeah. Um, now, you, you replied, you, you answered the survey a, a, a lot about your um, employment situation. What, yeah. How's that, how, how is that, and how does that affect you? Um, so I work for a charity, actually, and um, I was furloughed early on, but um, I, was, I was also homeschooling. Um, but I don't earn a massive amount Anyway, on a full-time salary, uh, I'll let you know what, on my normal salary. So uh, although people are like, oh, it's great, you know, and, and that was driving me a bit mad. People, you know, like, oh, it's great. You can just sit at home and do nothing, get part of your salary. But for me, losing that part of sat my salary, I've still got to pay my rent. I can't get a mortgage holiday because I don't have a mortgage. I've still got to pay my rent. still got to pay my council tax. still got to pay all my bills. Bills are now higher because we're in the house all the time, which we weren't before. The water's gone up. The electricity's gone up. Can't get access to anything. We couldn't get any food. I was ill for the first five weeks. We couldn't get out of the house. We couldn't get any deliveries. Schooling, we didn't have a printer. We didn't have paper. There was no, I mean, everything was like 50 million times the price to get them at the beginning. Um, and I think as time's gone on, I, you know, like I said, I work in a charity. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know. I still don't really know what the future holds. Um, and Apart from all the other things that you know were going on during lockdown um, here in the house and with with my daughter and stuff, um, you know, I'd, if I then get made redundant, I've got all the extra bills that I've, I've mounted up. I had to use my credit card because I had to I had to buy stuff. I had to get I had to pay 
twice as much for food that I would normally for, you know, all the bills and everything. If I had to use my credit card, if I get made redundant, I, you know, I am on you. I, I applied for universal credit about week six. Well, I, I came in about week seven, I think eight. I can't remember what the, I must have applied week two or two and a half something. Um, yeah, I don't. I I I I'm feel like I'm in a constant state of stress because because I because the bills are out enough and I just don't know and I just don't know when it's going to end if it's going to end how I'm going to manage. It's just myself and my daughter, my little one. So there's no one else to rely on. It's just yeah and yeah definitely has had a massive is having a massive effect on my mental health. On your mental health as well. Yeah, I mean it's impossible not to have that um, impact and you're stressed about trying to get through paying the bills and everything i mean it, it's uh, it's really difficult and you and you're financially you've got to worry about the next bit with the work um well thank you for joining us and, and i hope it all works out um and you, and and we and, and you get through this okay um i'm going to move on to kate in bristol uh, are you there kate yeah i'm here um, now you're you, you run your own business, um, yeah. So how how has how has lockdown affected your business and and your mental health and and all other aspects of your life? Well, I'm I'm a self-employed therapist, and so when lockdown came in, I had to completely shut my business, and I was shut for four months. Um, partly that was because the government guidelines were so unclear that there were aspects of my business that I could have carried on, but it was just so uncertain as to whether that was appropriate or not, whether I'd be covered with my insurance. And then there was a delay because um, the government wrongly classified what I do as a spa therapy. So there was a further delay on me being able to start back um, on my treatments just because someone just didn't bother to sort of look at things and categorize them properly. Um, but there's another aspect is that part of what I do is work with um, autistic children and teenagers and um, we've been having a massive build up in the SEND crisis in this country for the last few years with the cuts to resources as anyone who works with um, autistic children and teenagers know routine is key um, there needs to be stability there needs to be predictability otherwise behaviors that challenge and anxieties just just skyrocket and what we've seen is people's, um, it, people's children are just really, really struggling because they don't get to go to school. They don't get the normal treatments that help them manage their anxieties. And, and um, it, it's just been a complete nightmare on that side of things as well, um, because they just weren't, they weren't able to access treatments that would otherwise help them. And there was no reason for social distancing that they couldn't access the treatments it was just lack of awareness and lack of information so it's been really difficult so you, you've not only been struggling because you can open and work but but you've noticed that because you couldn't it's got worse for many other people yeah. so it must be really frustrating to see to see that do, do you um do you think if it comes back to another lockdown that you'll have to close again and it will get I, worse? I don't know. I know that a lot of the people that I worked with who had adults with men, with anxiety and mental health problems, they they are still sort of struggling to get back to where they were before um, lockdown. Um, some people flourish in difficult situations. But other people, if you're fragile and, you know, you have issues anyway it just it just becomes magnified and it's a lot to do with support groups um, but I think if we go into another lockdown in winter and people are isolated from their families particularly students maybe not being able to go home when you know I mean when you're going into adulthood you don't understand necessarily that a period of depression that you enter into won't won't always last you know as we get older we have mental health issues and we we kind of understand that they don't last. You kind of have good days and bad days and it goes up and down. But teenagers and young adults are really especially vulnerable because they don't have that sort of knowledge. And, um, and I, I worry that people will just be really, really fragile, especially over the winter. So it could cause a trauma um, in younger people that could lead- I think it already has. 
longer term yeah. mental health problems. I think it already has, and I think it's it's more likely to continue. And I think with all the problems that people have been talking about, about income, you know, young people who are furloughed, some people, like the lady said, some people think that's great. For other people, other people are aware that if you're furloughed, that might be, mean that your job is dispensable and that you might be first in line for redundancies. And that's an awful fear to live with for months and months and months. It's, you know, it's good to have a bit of stable income but not to know really what's going to happen. It's, it's the uncertainty that kills everybody. Yeah. It's the unpredictability and not being able to plan. Uh, well, um, thank you um, for coming on. Um, I'm going to uh, bring in Monica uh, Schwartz, um, who's in, I think, in Islington, um, in the constituency of... Jeremy Corbyn, are you there, Monica? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I can't see you yet, but um, I'm sure... No, I'm yeah. here. Okay, you, you seem to have unmuted. Uh... I mute myself and then somebody... There you are. Can, can you hear me? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you um, hear me? Would, would you, yeah, would you... Would, would you let uh, you you replied that you're uh, it, you've got your own business and it hasn't been so bad for you so maybe you can give a a, a, a nice positive story for the counter <laughs> well, all the gloom yeah. and gloom yes well um because actually my my work is um providing casework and clinical supervision for frontline workers um it has meant that i actually have been inundated with work um, and I am supporting people who are working in very stressful situations such as domestic violence, working with no recourse to public funds, working with the homeless, um, working across communities. Most of the people I support are from BME communities. So from that perspective, um, although it means that for me, I've been very busy. And also we started um, a mutual aid group uh, in Islington and um, I'm the coordinator of my local ward, Junction Ward. And um, what we've done is, is we've set up very positive neighborly and um, we do dog walking, we do shopping, we do um, support on the phone. And it's been interesting in a way because it means now I know a lot more people in my ward. Um, but, you know, having supporting those people and we also started a gardening club on the local estate um, so people could get out and meet each other. And we've had pizza parties and all sorts of other things because it's been really essential to do that. And also people have brought their kids. Um, so, I mean, I think like although there have been negatives like people who live in the area can no longer afford the rent so they've had to move out um, i'm also a governor of a mental health trust um, and that's been very interesting because um we're supposed to hold people to account and yet because of lockdown a bit like parliament they're much you know we, we we're getting pushed further away of actually being able to monitor what's happening in the services um so, I mean, for me, I, 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 I'm blessed. My daughter doesn't live very far away. I've been able to see my grandson. Um, unfortunately, my mother lives in the West Midlands. Um, and although I speak to her on the phone every day, especially now, I'm not able to travel there because of lockdown in, in, in Birmingham. So I think it's been a bit of a mixed thing, but I will say that, you know, what it has done has really brought the community together. I work with people I would have never worked with before. Um, but on the other hand, people are really struggling in frontline services um, because a bit of what I think people have said about, you know, getting other services to react. Everybody's on Zoom. So there's a real worry about clients that you can't see, especially in domestic violence situations. Right. Um, so, you know, it's a mixed thing. And I think the worry now is at least it was there was sunshine in the summer. Um, but I do worry. Uh, I worry about the people we maybe have missed out. We're going to re-leaflet our whole area again to say, look, 
mutual aid is still alive and kicking. Um, but I do worry that, you know, there are some people who are just holding on. Um, and there are people that we probably even are not knowing. I mean, we have a very good, we have a very good relationship with the local council. Um, they're very much supporting us through the mutual aid. Um, I'm lucky that most of the people that I've done supervision with have kept working because they're frontline and they've, you know, they've managed to keep going. But my worry is that how, you know, I think people know, um, you know, worry that they're, that, that, you know, how long is this going to go on yeah. for? I mean, that, that seems to be what you've been doing well so far is almost what you're saying, but we don't know how, how long this can continue um thank you for coming thank you for joining uh, us monica um i'm going to move up to the to yorkshire to west yorkshire to stanley bates are you there stanley i'm here christine uh, good to see you hi uh, now you you run a business in and you, you you in your survey you said that you're struggling um with that is that uh, can you tell us a bit more about what's happening yeah, to put it in perspective, Crispin, um, I consider myself and my partner very fortunate because we retired officially, so I get a pension. Um, briefly to explain it, the business came about because we, we love caravanning. Um, uh, my partner is now, she suffered from arthritis and it's an advanced stage. So she's basically mobility issues and I'm virtually a full-time carer now. But I came up with a little gadget. If you've ever been caravanning, putting on the awning, it's an extremely stressful job. And I came up with a gadget that uh, makes it easy. So I could do it on my own and it made it easier. Uh, and I commercialised it four or five years ago. Year on year, the sales went up and I was doing pretty well with it. It gave us a good income. But it's not been devastating. But obviously, when the lockdown came and the campsite was shut, my sales just came. At, normally, it would be the peak sales. It, it came to zero. But what I thought about was if I was young and relying on that business, it would have killed me. Um, you just talked about spin-offs from it, but uh, since they released that and, and, and people can go caravanning again, there's been a boom in it because people are preferring that to go abroad. So the spin-offs there, although it killed me over, the, it, it didn't bankrupt us because I've got no premises. I just produce it in a workshop in the bottom of my garden. Um, but, but, you're, yeah. but, but you think if you hadn't the security of your pension, then you... Exactly, you'd yeah. Be, I, I just thought yeah, if I was young with a mortgage and having to make the business work, it would have killed me because the sale just went completely dead for three months. But now it's booming again. again. But uh, when I filled in your survey, um, because I, <clears throat> somebody mentioned earlier about the, the Labour family, that's been a major help to me. I, I'm chair of my local branch. I've recently become the CLP secretary. And it takes up your time. You don't think about things. And I hear stories every week about other people a lot worse off than us. We are quite fortunate because we don't have those financial worries. Um, we don't jet off on holidays anymore because my partner just can't stand the departure in departure desk and things like that. And, and flying is quite hazardous to our health. So, we're not, and, but when I filled in your survey, I said, how has it affected me and my partner? I think there are underlying issues there. I mean, I like to go out for a pint on a night, or I used to. Um, but we actually went into lockdown before it became official because I didn't believe the virus was safe until the go government told us it was, you know. I don't believe the virus is, only comes out after 10 o'clock. <laughs> but really, I used to love going out for a drink and having a political debate and causing arguments, and I used to love it. But now I'm not bothered. You know, and I think that's an underlying thing, and I, and I worry when but it's got down. Taking your sense then, of fun away, sorry? taking your sense of of fun and and bonhomie and and. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I never really thought about it until I did the survey, and since then I, I thought, how has it affected me? And I'm really, I'm getting. To, so, I mean, now we can go to the pub, and I get invites and that. I'm just not bothered anymore. You know. I, We've got a nice little garden outside. We can sit and have a drink. Luckily, my partner and I still get on pretty well, you know, and enjoy conversations. And I take the dog a walk. And, I, and I've noticed a difference in my partner, you know. So 
just to get her out of the house, let's go for the drive, and she's not interested. And and I think when I think about how that's affected me, you know, there's an underlying thing there, and it probably affects more people more a lot more. I've got a dear old friend who lives in a bungalow down the road from me. He's 92 years old, and I bump into him now and again, and I always walk past his bungalow and I take his dog. And when it's dark, his lights don't come on. He, he's, the television's not a friend to him because he can't really see very well. And he, he, when he speaks to me, and he opens up. He's very, very lonely, and I can see him deteriorating. You know, and so although I think I'm lucky, and 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 I, and I do see how it. There's an underlying how it's affected me that I'm not bothered about going out anymore. What's right. it like for a lonely old person, you know? And, and he's, he's losing that contact with people and how to interact with people. I think yeah. that's happening to me as well because I'm not bothered about going out anymore. I used to love it, if you understand what I'm saying. Then. Yeah. All right. Well, th thank you for thank you for sharing your story, Stanley. Um, and I'm going to move back to um, I'm going to move back to Southport. I think. To speak to Mary Doyle. Are you there, Mary? <laughs> it's very. Very? Very. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, I'm not good at the... Um... No, you're English. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll learn a bit. Uh, can you say it again? Very. Very. Right. It's, it's very. The, like a V. Sounds M like a V. A v. Yeah. M, M as in V. All right. Okay. I'll remember that. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, you 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 wrote in your survey that it's it's been quite pleasant for you in some ways because you've been able to see your family more. Um, yeah, I, I um, I, I'm a, a labour councillor up in Southport, and if Rachel wants to get in touch with me over our benefits, I'm ex DWP, so maybe I can help her. Um, she can get my my phone number off the Sefton website. Right. Um, I, my daughter came and kidnapped me when lockdown started because my husband died six years ago and she was worried about me being by myself. So she took me down to Walton on Thames where she worked in the front room. Her husband was working in the other room and I've got three granddaughters, a nearly five, a nearly seven and a nearly nine. And I did three months of homeschooling which nearly killed me, and that mental health. And I also, I think, was inducted into modern slavery because that's what it felt like, because I did everything. And uh, But it was wonderful because I, I got so close to everybody. When you live by yourself, it's really hard. And I'd been... Um, I'm, I'm 71, so they locked me up early, you know? Um, and... I'm very active and I do lots and lots of things and not being able to go and see people or, or and hug people. You know, you're not allowed to touch anybody anymore. And, and that is really, really hard. And my eldest son has, um, he's going to be 45 and he suffers really badly from anxiety. And this last sort of, well, since the beginning of the year, since it started, his whole topic of conversation is COVID related. And, and he's really, really distressed about catching it, you know? And I mean, we in, in, on, on Merseyside now, we've gone back into special measures and we're going to have extra special me measures probably within the next week. And, and he's not coping very well at all. And it's a worry. And, and, you know, when you've got your, your five-year-old granddaughter talking about people dying all the time, you know, children should be enjoying their, their childhood. They shouldn't be worrying about people dying. And I think society has changed out of all recognition. Um, my, my sister's up in Scotland and, and she was a mental health nurse, so she knows all about this sort of stuff. And yet she was frightened to go out. She had to make herself go out of the house because, you know, we, we need to get a, a bit of um, sanity into this whole thing. Um, this, is, this is our new normal. And we all have to learn to adapt to it and, and work within it. But it's so scary. It's so scary. I'm back home now. 
and um, I've, 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 you know, I, I've had lots of residents phoning me up with issues about not being able to get food, um, being being shielded, and and not. But Sefton Council, I feel, has have really worked hard at that, and and really done their best. And the staff have been amazing. The staff have been amazing. You, it's not easy under this government. Do, do you worry about this continuing for many more months? I mean, do you yeah. think it will it yeah. will really start to? I mean, it's bad enough from what you've said about some people how it's affected them, but if it carries on, I, I, I you know, we're all herd animals, aren't we? We like to be together. We like to hug each other. We like to smile together and laugh. And we're not. That's been taken out. It's been taken up. And you know, I think we were we were all really on the same sort of website until it was discovered that the way to test your eyes was to drive to Barnard Castle. After that, it all went downhill. And and people just think it's gone away. Especially people down south, because it's not very high down there. It's it's really quite um, scary up here. And it's getting worse. Oh, well, um, that, that's not... Um... Well, thank you, thank you for thank you for coming on the show. Um, I'm going to move on to David in Litchfield in Staffordshire. Uh, are you there, David? Um, David. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. So you 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 were in a survey that 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 the uh, lockdown. <laughs> Had a, an impact on your, oh, on your family. And I like the shaking. Yeah. It's good. It's good drama. Um, uh, it had a, an impact on your family and and friends. Would you like to share what what you said there? Well, I think it's we've become closer to get as a family, you know, and me and friends. Me, because obviously, our because of my underlying health issues. Uh, from March, I was self-isolating. Uh, but uh, like I say, my sister phones every day. I've got two great friends that get keep in touch with us every day. I've got a comrade across the road. She was doing me shopping for us as well as my sister, you know. And, uh, and we, you know when we had the clap for the NHS? Yeah. When we used to, the whole street used to come out. And then there was really a community spirit. I thought, you know, and I'm lucky because I'm on benefits, so I haven't got to worry about money coming in, you know, and I've got my own house. So I'm quite lucky compared to a lot of other people. I've got a garden, you know, so I, 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 I'm quite happy. But I have got a friend who works in mental health, and he, he's been saying for years it's been underfunded, underfunded, underfunded. But it affected him badly because he had to isolate through due to ill health as well. And it drove him up the wall because he can't he has to be on the go all the time, non-stop. But luckily the hospital he works in managed to find him a job answering the the phones for people with problems. The local health authority set up for um people with depression and anxieties a phone line that was open 24 hours a day. So that helped him, you know. But me personally, I'm just lucky the family and friends I've got, I, you know. Right. I mean, I, I, do, I, I do get down. I do, I mean, obviously I do suffer with depression. I'm on antidepressants, you know, but it's only mild. But myself, the one thing I have learned, I thought I was a loner. And I like my own company, but I don't. I miss the interaction with family and friends, you know. So, though I'm compared to people who've spoke before me, I'm living the life of Riley. I've got nothing to complain about, you know. Um, but I've found it, like I say, it's brought me family and friends a lot closer. Okay. We were closed, but really close you know i've got like i say 
Me one mate texts us every day and phones us a couple of times every week. Me other one mate phones us every day for an hour to talk and that, you know, so at least I've got, I can communicate with people. You know, oh. my sister, like she phones up twice today. I'm sure she thinks she's my mother. But that, it's good to hear that you're, you're, it's, it's, it's improved uh, relationships uh, as well. I mean, I, there were people on the survey who said that it's had a bad impact bad their, on their personal relationships. And that, that's pr probably inevitable if you're cooped well, up. Well, maybe because I live by myself, you see, I've got, haven't got a partner. So maybe if I had, we might have been in each other's throats, mind me, you know, because um, being locked up together in a small bungalow, it must drive your potty yeah. or in a flat even. I'm lucky I can get in the back garden. Do you know what I mean? With yeah. people in flats and that, I can't, I don't know how they cope, especially with children. And to be honest, this government has let me down from day one. Well, that, it's been an I'm absolute got, disgrace. I'm, I'm going to have to move on. Thank you again for joining uh, us, uh, David. Anytime, Crispin. I enjoy it. Thank you. Um, Christina in Essex. Um, there you are. Some call it Essex. Some still call it a uh, London Borough. Oh, okay. it was Essex. It were London Borough of Havering, but it was obviously Essex until um, 1965. But most residents still see it as Essex. Um, okay, so uh, wh wh wherever you are. Um, what wh what's the what's the situation for for you? Do you think with um, with what I noticed in your answer to the survey was you didn't think that many people were following the rules of the government. Um, what, what made you say that? What have you seen that, that that made you say that? Just in this area, I think like it is a Tory stronghold. And one thing about this area is that, you know, they don't like being told what to do. It's predominantly Tories and, you know, that's something they're totally opposed to. So it's they've actually it's kind of gone full circle where they can't most people, especially most people I know, actually were all massive forest supporters and they're all now massive forest haters because they feel like they're being restricted and you know that goes against everything that they, they believe in. So um so many won't adhere to the rules just because they've been quite militant really. They don't like being told what to do. So that's it. So you see that you know, the refusal to wear masks, you know, they still go out, just carry on life as normal. Our neighbours will still be having parties, mass parties in the gardens. So it's just gone the opposite, really. So especially when it was the, they were restricted to the groups of six, that was just out the window. That was, you just, you just drive past any pubs and you'd see the beer gardens. There was no one adhering to that. So, I mean, even yesterday when I was in, um, in Romford and was at McDonald's and you had to queue and there was a nice lady on man in the door um a little bit older and you know people well there was a woman in front with a, a, a grown-up daughter refusing to wear the mask arguing with her refusing to do any uh, test and trace refusing to leave her details just push past bombarded yeah when I spoke to the woman she said like there's just nothing she can do she's got no control there's you know, need security on the door really to stop these people. So it's quite bad. Do you think um, that that's got worse? Yeah, as, absolutely. As, yeah. At first, at first when we went into lockdown, you know, everyone in the area was practically everyone was adhering to it. But where there hasn't been a clear, concise message, they now just don't believe anything that they're being told. So they're not listening to anything it's it's you know their way or the highway they're just not listening so it'll be quite interesting to see how it unfolds in the next few weeks really because I don't know I think to myself will people will it go back to how it was but I I just don't think it will to be honest people are still out the pubs are still full people are just going out earlier so instead of going out you know as it as, as you would have maybe eight o'clock seven or eight o'clock meet up it's now well come on let's meet up at five or four do you see what I'm saying so nothing's really changing people are just going out because and and then just taking the party on elsewhere right okay well look, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on thank you very much for sharing that because we are now going to speak to Rob hello <laughs> that was uh, 
how are you doing, Rob? Yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, yeah. what's your, you know, that I, I think what we saw on this show tonight was um, lockdown is definitely having a, a really bad impact on lots of people. And, um, and the fact that lots of people are not following the rules as well, uh, it seems to me the government and the Labour Party have got to get this issue out there and, and actually discuss it and, and talk about it more instead of just imposing it. Well, that's my take. What, yeah. what's, your, what's your view on it? Well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because you, 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 you're, having, you're having to cope with the fact that you, you're living in a society that has a ruling class that flouts, flouts its own rules. Uh, you know, someone mentioned, you know, drives to bar drives to Durham when it feels like it, has its, has its wife's birthday at Barnum Castle. Boris's dad pops off to uh, Greece and s swims in the sea, and uh, Boris probably has his christening somewhere else than it's, it's claimed to be. And, you know, and it, we're all supposed to go home at 10 o'clock, whereas uh, you can go grouse shooting and hunting and uh, as long as you like. So it's difficult to expect people to behave with any kind of degree of social responsibility, because so uh, since since Auntie Thatcher declared that um, there's no such thing as society, people have been encouraged to be selfish, to not think of the community, to not think of maybe other people, to not have any sense of social responsibility. So yeah, it's a bit of an uphill struggle, isn't it? I and mean, we've we've heard from people who uh, the problems that that everybody faces and. There's not a quick fix solution. Actually, the quick fix solution isn't isn't just going out and doing what you like. You know, the quick fix solution is building a, building a sense of community among and 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 encouraging us to feel a social responsibility. My point's always been, I think that I I'm quite happy to wear a mask. I'm quite happy to not not do gigs if it means that I don't kill someone. That's that's my that's my bottom line. I'd, I'd rather stick a mask on. I'd rather stick two meters away from someone than I'd do that than risk passing on a passing on an infection that might kill someone. Call me Mr. Sentimental, but if it's you know if it's if if it's your child or your parent that dies, then you have a different perspective, don't you? So, well, uh, you you should do the 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 rounding up on all these shows because. Uh, right. Mr. Grumpy, sorry. <laughs> uh, that, that's 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 what you've got. You've got another song uh, to, that we're playing today, and it's from your Pandemic Songs album. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's called the highlight of my week. Yes, which which for a long time has been and still is staying for Labour and Labour Grassroots, where I get to see lots of people who who still believe the best in humanity. Today the sun was shining, the sky was high and wide, the rain was forecast later, so they moved the queue inside. But they had all those holy grails us lockdown pilgrims seek, wipes and paracetamols, the highlight of my week. Yeah, it's good to be in Tesco's It's always good to know Someone's got a plan that gets you Where you need to go While we wait for the curve to flatten While we wait for the toll to peak Little miracles still happen It's the highlight of my week
wipe down our deliveries, learn to live apart. We feel the social distance fall like silence on the heart. Don't think about those hospitals where the news is bad or bleak. It was good to see you anyway. It was the highlight of my week. Good to see you anyway. The highlight of my week. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, the highlight of my week. Thank you.